Okay, so with no further delay, I'm going to introduce Charles Swanton. Charles Swanton is a medical oncologist, but is uh, also uh, a leading researcher as, at, at Cancer Research UK. And um, he has been the one who triggered that heterogeneity issue. And we are really thankful in the terms of kidney cancer because it puts RCC in the limelight of all cancer biology. And we are pleased to listen to you. To sort of follow that up, kidney cancer is actually quite an extraordinary disease, um, and to study it has proven, I think, quite fruitful. For the simple perspective of this is that studying kidney cancer evolution is a lot more simple than studying lung cancer evolution because the disease is much more genomically stable. So that gives us an opportunity to really understand cancer biology in general, I think. So I'll try and illustrate some of the work that James Larkin, my colleagues in London, um, and various um, very supportive surgical colleagues at uh, the Marsden and guys, Kings and Thomases have been helping with over the course of the last um, year or two, uh, specifically. So the implications of th for therapy and outcome, I think, are the following when we think about heterogeneity. So we see heterogeneity both um, between patients with the same histological uh, subtype of disease, be that breast cancer, ER-negative breast cancer, or clear cell carcinoma of the kidney. We see heterogeneity within tumors, so-called intratumor heterogeneity that can be regionally um, separated. And we see heterogeneity at down at the single cell level, where we're beginning to appreciate that even within a tumor, every tumor cell may be subtly different and differ by distinct genetic events. And I think answering one of Lawrence's questions earlier, we have known about genetic heterogeneity for 30 or 40 years. It's just current technologies enabling us to explore and decipher it at much higher resolution than ever before. So our venture into this field started about four years ago when we set, up, set about trying to address or identify in the context of a Framework 7 consortium with Institute Gustave Roussy and the Royal Marsden and ourselves at Cancer Research UK, biomarkers of response to anti-angiogenic therapies as well as um, mTOR inhibitors. And to do this, we had to sort of take the fundamental premise that if you take one biopsy of a tumor, that biopsy would be representative of the entire genomic landscape of the patient's tumor. So we did a simple experiment where you take 10 biopsies from this patient's nephrectomy, as well as his perinephric metastasis and uh, chest wall metastasis, and um, sequence every gene in the human genome, all 22,000 genes, um, at about 100x coverage, which means um, we, we try to decipher some of the heterogeneity within an individual biopsy. And um, what we found is that only about a third of mutations shown in this heat map in red are present at ev in every region of the tumor. And about two-thirds of the mutations present, these are coding mutations across the genome, are present in one region but not another, suggesting that the majority of mutations in a single biopsy are not going to be present across every region of the tumor that we analyze in this disease. Now, the question we're really keen on answering now is, is this, is this a trend or is this the norm in kidney cancer? Um, and more specifically, are we likely to see this effect in other tumor types as well? And I'm afraid I don't have answers to those questions, but I've, we've got some early insights into clear cell carcinoma biology, both sporadic and more recently uh, germline VHL associated, which I'll show towards the end. So the first observation is in the first 10 patients we've looked at is that we see branched evolution in every case. So what do I mean by branched evolution? What I mean is that these tumors essentially are heterogeneous. That is, that we see regional separation of mutations that are present in one region, but not another. So in this case here, we see clear separation of the metastatic sites from the primary regions, and they share a common clonal origin in this case, like all sporadic tumors that we sequenced so far, um, a second hit um, in VHL. Um, either the first hit being VHL mutation, the second hit being 3P loss of heterozygosity, which is where uh, VHL is encoded. So we see branched evolution in the first 10 patients we've sequenced with clear cell um, renal carcinoma. This is sporadic disease. Um, and the, in the intriguing thing is that each patient has a different um, phylogenetic tree, a different tree shape. And I think that tree shape, ultimately, it's going to be quite interesting to address what is the relationship between the shape of the tree and the patient's subsequent disease course. Because one of the hypotheses we have is that patients with more simple tumors like this with limited branch evolution and limited heterogeneity, limited diversity, may fare better and have a better disease course than, let's say, this patient with a, a baobao tree-like tumor, which is branched almost from the moment it's it, it, it seeded, as it were. Um, and these very heterogeneous tumors, we wonder, may have a worse prognosis. And that's something that we're planning to address in the context of a longitudinal study between guys, Tim O'Brien, and the Marsden, David Nicholl, and, and uh, James Larkin. 
So I've shown you evidence for what we call micro, well, what Darwin called microevolution, and we're just simply poaching his terms. Um, and Darwin really argued that nature never makes major leaps, um, in Latin, natura non facit sortum. Um, and he said that profound change at a population level is the result of a very slow but continuous process. So in the case of genomic evolution in a cancer, we can think about that at the single gene level, where a single gene, single point mutation over time accumulates with many other genes to lead to profound change in clinical behavior, perhaps. And these gradual accumulation of the small mutations are the major driver of change, and that's been elaborated in neo-Darwinism theory over the last 40 or 50 years. But the challenge, I think, um, as we look ahead, is this one of cancer macroevolution. So what do I mean by macroevolution? Well, this, this chap, Goldschmidt, was a sort of pariah of evolutionary biology in the 60s and was ostracized from most of the um, major Ivy League universities as well as um, Oxbridge um, in evolutionary theory because he proposed that speciation was driven by macroevolutionary changes, that is, changes in whole chromosomes or parts of chromosomes that lead to the origin of new species. And these rare events result in profound change. And he coined this phrase that, that was, which led him to be the sort of a laughing stock of the evolutionary community called Hopeful Monsters. And he published this book called The Material Basis of Evolution. And unfortunately, because of this term, Hopeful Monsters, he was, he was ostracized from the evolutionary community. And his, his, his very valuable thoughts in this book have been rather marginalized. So why do I think these thoughts are valuable? Well, the first thing is that in this book, in figure 35, he draws this picture here of simple chromosomal rearrangements that he'd observed or was beginning to observe in nature. And we see these chromosomal arrangements time and time again, not just in, in kidney cancer biology, but in all tumor types we look at. Um, and he postulated that this macroevolution must proceed by a different genetic method rather than single point mutations, but through the rearrangements of serial chemical constituents of the chromosome, essentially. So why does any of this matter? Well, it matters because we see chromosomal aberrations time and time again in pretty much all solid tumors. And these can um, be uh, chromosomal instability in terms of structural and numerical abnormalities, or rearrangements of those chromosomes by chromothripsis or chromoplexy, where you essentially get fragmentation of the chromosome and reannealing either to the same chromosome or parts of different chromosomes, really creating sort of a mishmash, a jumble of chromosomal DNA that can be um, that can essentially encode for new genes or perhaps um, amplified genes in ways which um, a normal eukaryotic cell um, is not designed to tolerate. And so I think this, this aspect of cancer macroevolution is something we need to think about um, in, in, in future studies of this disease, both kidney cancer and other tumor types. And I'll show you some brief evidence for that. So when we looked at our first patient, um, we looked at this phenomenon of chromosomal instability. Because what we saw at the metastatic sites were the, the mutations in the metastatic sites were essentially pretty much all the same. So in the chest wall metastasis and the perinephric metastasis, the mutations were almost identical. So this made us think that the patient was still alive at the time. We thought, well, perhaps we could identify a mutation that's present in all metastatic sites. We might be able to find a new drug to offer this patient that might be effective and treat all of the metastatic disease. So we did a control experiment to look in a bit more detail whether macroevolution might now be fostering change in this tumor. And so what we did is we applied fax analysis, which is essentially where we count the chromosomes in each biopsy to work out whether chromosomal instability was occurring in this tumor. And what we found is that region four of the tumor was most similar to the chest wall metastases and the perinephric metastases. Most of the regions of the primary were diploid, like all of the cells in our body, but region four had doubled its genome and become tetraploid and had spawned the metastatic colonies that had now become chromosomally unstable. And so you can look at this at a, at a more uh, microscopic level or higher resolution level by applying SNP CGH technologies to look at the ratio between the maternal and paternal allele across the genome. And what you see in the region four, this perfectly balanced tetraploid genome, double genome, when you look at the ratio of paternal to maternal chromosomes, chromosome 3P, um, it is showing allelic imbalance. This is where VHL is encoded. So we've got loss of one allele on chromosome 3P. And we have another small area of loss of heterozygosity on chromosome 16P. But other than that, the tumor genome is perfectly balanced. So the ratio of the maternal to the paternal alleles are identical. But now let's look at the chest wall metastasis here, M2A and M2B. These are 
biopsy separated by only a centimetre that have exactly the same exome level mutations, here you can see they have very different chromosomal copy number events across the genome. And what this indicated to us is that actually these tumor, gen tumor genomes are not the same at all. Despite them having very similar exome mutations, they have very different gene dosages. And I think this, this diversity within a single metastasis is something that we need to worry about or at least think about um, as we move ahead with these types of studies. And we've known for many years that chromosomal instability, that's variation in whole chromosomes or parts of chromosomes, is a poor prognostic feature. Again, emphasizing Laurence's question earlier, is, is heterogeneity a new phenomenon? It's not a new phenomenon. We're just simply being able to resolve it much better than ever before. So what, why is any of this relevant to uh, clinical trial opportunities or drug development in general? Well, I think one aspect of this is we think, if we think about tumors like trees, targeting the early events in the tumor, the so-called trunk events that are present ubiquitously at every site of disease, might be a more tractable approach than targeting um, individual subclones with drivers present in one branch but not another. So in the context of clear cell carcinoma of the kidney, what are these truncal ubiquitous events? Well, they are, in fact, quite simply VHL. VHL mutation and 3P loss of heterozygosity are the core truncal events that are present in every sporadic tumor that we've looked at, and that'll come as no surprise to this audience. So how can we identify these truncal events? Um, this gets a little bit geeky, but I think it is quite important because I think it really gets to grips with how we can use emerging technologies to better structure clinical trials and some of the caveats with new technologies when thinking about structuring clinical trials to identify those trunk events. So when we look at, um, we take a next generation sequencing approach, what we're trying to do is we're sequencing each gene in turn, and we do it multiple times. A number of times we capture a mutation tells us something about the prevalence of that mutation within that cancer that we're sequencing. And that's called the variant allele frequency, the VAF, V-A-F. And we can, we can mirror that on a graph between 0 and 100%. A heterozygous mutation in a perfect tumor with no stromal contamination will occur about 50% of reads. So about 50% of times we will identify that mutation. And that's what we see with VHL in this tumor here across these multiple biopsies. It's occurring in about half of all the reads in keeping with a heterozygous event. Now, if we then look at other mutations in this tumor, other known drivers of kidney cancer biology, P10, PBRM1, and ATM, these are also occurring between about 40 and 50% in this biopsy here, shown in yellow. So we get the idea from this that perhaps all four of these genes are truncal because they're present uniformly at around 40 to 50% of reads that we're, we're getting from the sequencing reaction. And that's zoomed in a bit here. But then when we look at more biopsies, what we suddenly find is that these, these drivers that we thought were truncal, that were present early on in tumor evolution, are in fact not truncal at all because they're completely absent in these regions here, region 10, the venous thrombus, and region 3. So these so-called clonally dominant lesions here are actually subclonal because they're not present here. So in fact, when you portray them on a tree, the only one that is in the trunk is VHL, and these three here are all in separate branches of the tumor. So one biopsy in clear cell carcinoma in this case is misleading. We cannot um, infer clonal dominance from just looking at one biopsy. And the reason for that, I think, is that in clear cell carcinoma of the kidney, we're dealing with such large tumors that have evolved potentially over quite a long time. There's been a lot of time for regional separation of these subclones, generating what we call, or we've adopted the sort of evolutionary term, allopatric separation of subclones, a little bit like allopatric speciation, where you get new species developing on islands that are geographically isolated. Not too dissimilar to that is what we see in clear cell carcinoma of the kidney, where you see independent subclones evolving within the same tumor, separated by what we can anticipate might be conceived as clear tissue planes in this patient's tumor. So what next? Well, I think the pro part of the problem for treatment failure um, and resistance to targeted therapies that we see so often in the clinical setting, I think is likely to be occurring through this problem of subclonal driver events. So what do I mean by subclonal driver events? Well, simply put, these are driver events that are in the branches but not in the trunk. So these are driver events that one biopsy is not going to be able to identify. And the problem is at the moment we simply don't know how many of these driver events are actually operating in a typical patient's clear cell carcinoma. We really don't know for sure how many driver events are really implicated in the biology of a single patient. In this patient, you can see here we've got VHL as the truncal event, and then we've got three or four driver events that are present in some regions, but not others. And so when we look at the first 10 patients, 
eight of those patients, eight of the ten patients, have more subclonal drivers, that is, drivers that are spatially separated in the patient's tumour, than they have drivers that are present in every biopsy. I think this begins to shed some light on why resistance to therapy in advanced disease, it's targeted therapy at least, is so inevitable. So when we try to calculate the number of driver events, these are recurrent events that occur time and time again that we identify sequencing multiple clear cell carcinomas over the kidneys. It's been well described by at least four groups internationally. When we try to define the number of driver events in a patient's tumour by a single biopsy, we think now we're underestimating the number of driver events quite considerably. So let's take P53 as an example, a common tumour suppressor that's commonly mutated. In kidney cancer, it's estimated on a per-biopsy basis, about 1 in 20 patients has a mutation of P53. When we look at this on a per-patient basis, sequencing between 5 and 10 biopsies per patient, we can find evidence of a P53 mutation in up to 40% of patients. So this driver event is more common than a single biopsy would, ha would have us believe. So how on earth can we map the total genomic landscape of a tumour? Well, the simple fact of the matter is it's, it's difficult. It's very difficult in clear cell carcinoma of the kidney, I think. And one way we're exploring at the moment is taking circulating free DNA from patients' blood, and then sequencing that to try to identify the number of drivers that might be operating. And we're having limited and early success in this area, identifying branch mutations that were only identifiable through spatial separation of biopsies. We can now identify many of these spatially separated mutations in a single blood draw by ultra-deep sequencing at 10,000x coverage. Suggesting that in the future, we hope, this may be a way of resolving in a sort of soup of tumor material, if you like, the diversity present in one tumor mass. So where can we go moving ahead? What new drug targets can we think about trying to exploit? What, what, what does the future hold in the next 10 years that, that Martin might talk about tomorrow? Well, I think one of the issues is this issue of convergence. It's quite a phenomenal um, um, event in evolution. It's been well described before in ecology that we're beginning to see in cancer, in cancer medicine. Can we start thinking about tumors like, like a game of chess in three dimensions in a way? So can we predict the next chess move, uh, playing a game of chess against this, evil, this, this, this grand master? Can we pr predict Kasparov's next move 10 moves in advance and do something about it to, to forestall Kasparov or Karpov from making that move? So why do I say this? Well, in the context of clear cell carcinoma of the kidney, we're seeing a lot of convergence. So what do I mean by convergence? What I mean by convergence is despite the heterogeneity, we see these tumours have to inactivate the same gene time and time again in different branches, in different, different spatially separated branches of the tumour. So this is the first patient we looked at. This patient has three different set D2 mutations and three different KDM5C mutations in five different regions of this patient's tumour. So suggesting that wherever this, these subclones are evolving, the evolutionary pressures are similar, resulting in activation of the same genes. So if we knew that by understanding the trunk in a bit more detail, and we had drugs that might forestall the tumour from making that move, could this be a tractable way of, of using evolution to the patient's advantage? And so we're seeing this time and time again. Here's another example. This is a chromatin remodeling complex called the swy sniff complex. What we see is a very complicated complex, protein complex, formed by 10 or 11 proteins in a cell. And this tumor has inactivated the protein complex in three different ways by mutating one or more of um, the member of this particular complex, PBRM1, ARID1A, or SMARCA4. And we see this in the context of mTOR pathway um, activation, a common conversion to vent in clear cell carcinoma. On a per-biopsy basis, we see about one in five patients has an activating event um, of the mTOR pathway. But when we look at a per-patient basis, we see that up to 60% of patients can have at least one or more aberrations in this pathway, shown here, where we see distinct mutations in P10, a P10 mutation in one branch and an mTOR activating mutation in another, or two distinct PIK3CA mutations in different branches of the patient's tumor. And so overall, we see genetic convergence in six out of 10 of these patients, suggesting that perhaps there may be some future in predicting the next evolutionary move. So, so to elaborate on this, I think we need to think about targeting the trunk drivers that are present in every cell. So we need new drugs that can optimally target VHL loss of function. And we need to think about exploiting some of the convergence events in the tumor mass and predicting the next resistance move that tumor may take by selection of a one branch over another, what, what new subclones may dominate the disease uh, at resistance. 
But we're also not talking about somatic mutations. I mentioned macroevolution. We have this problem of copy number aberration, so-called SCNA heterogeneity. In the context of clear cell carcinoma, we see that the only copy number event that's known in clear cell carcinoma, which there are about 8 to 10, that recurrently occur is either recurrently gained or recurrently lost. These are parts of the chromosome or chromosome arms that are currently gained or lost. The only one that's always present in every biopsy is 3P loss of heterozygosity, shown here where my green arrow is. All the others are present in some biopsies but not others. And so when you then map the copy number aberrations with the somatic mutations onto these phylogenetic trees, you can see they get a lot more complex. And I must say that this is probably only the tip of the iceberg for each patient because we still are only sequencing 10 biopsies per patient in these very large 250 centimeter cube tumors. And that's not including most of the metastatic sites. I think if we did that too, these trees would get a lot more ornate and a lot more complex. But they would still share VHL as the core truncal driver. So some of this, I think, has some impact on our understanding of tumor biomarker development and um, thinking about the next generation of biomarkers. To have a biomarker that's going to tell us something useful, it's got to evade sampling bias if we're relying on a single biopsy in the context of clear cell carcinoma of the kidney. So we've, we've applied more recently um, a poor prognostic and a good prognostic mRNA expression signature set, um, the so-called CCA-CCB signature, to clear cell carcinoma of the kidney, these 10 tumors that I've shown you today. Um, this is an expression profile um, that segregates out good from poor prognostic uh, patients. And what we find is that in um, 8 out of 10 of the tumors at different regions give us different outcomes. So we showed this initially in, in patient 1 back in 2012, and we've more recently applied this to the 10 patients. And in 8 out of the 10 patients, we see divergence, with some regions harboring a poor prognostic signature, some regions harboring a good prognostic signature. The fact is, though, that in our meta-analysis that we're about to submit for review, this is still the best prognostic signature we've come across. So we've tested multiple prognostic signatures, and this appears to be the best. So it does work in some cases, but potentially not quite all, simply because of this issue of sampling bias, that some subclones still remain in the tumor and harbor a good prognostic subclone compared to the majority of this tumor here, which might be a poor prognostic subclone. So this is a complicated problem. Sampling bias is likely to impact and confound um, biomarker development, and it's something I think we need to think about when coming up with new biomarkers that better forecast outcome for patients. So one question we're really very interested in, in really getting to grips with is how many drivers are present in these tumors? How many drivers are present in a typical large clear cell carcinoma in the kidney with multiple metastatic sites? And to coin a phrase from a collaborator of ours, Andy Futrell, who's now at MD Anderson, who asked this question after our first patient was sequenced, he said, Charlie, the problem is we don't know how deep the rabbit hole is. So we're trying to now address exactly how deep the rabbit hole is by taking hundreds of biopsies across these tumors to count the number of drivers that are present in the tumor. And I don't think that's a stamp collecting exercise. So the simple reason is that traditionally we, we feel or we, we know from mouse models of cancer, et cetera, that four or five drivers are required to initiate tumorigenesis. But we don't know yet how many drivers commonly occur in a patient with advanced metastatic disease. And I think clear cell carcinoma of the kidney will lead the way in being able to tell us and answer that quite quickly. And we're doing this because when we plot the number of biopsies against the number of driver events, you can see in some of these tumors that we're sequencing, we're seeing no um, tailing off of the curve. So we're just seeing the more biopsies we look at, the more driver events we find. And we're getting up to 20 driver events in this patient with a slight tailing off of the curve here. So we hope by looking at more biopsies, we'll be able to understand how many drivers really are implicated, which might have some impact on targeted therapies and thinking about future drug development strategies. So to summarize um, two-thirds of my talk, I'd just like to say about two-thirds of the drivers are heterogeneous and spatially separated. We can't see these branch drivers from a single biopsy, so we need multiple biopsies, at least using this type of strategy, to resolve the number of subclonal drivers that are readily distinguished in clear cell carcinoma of the kidney. Current sampling techniques underestimate the number of driver events in, in clear cell carcinoma of the kidney. And I think if you think about this sort of philosophically, if each tumor harbors a, a similar trunk event, so they've all got VHL loss and they've all got um, VHL mutations, but every patient's outcome is different, then perhaps that's telling us something about the branched evolutionary events that are occurring in the tumor and the potential impact of those branched events on patient outcome. So we probably do need to understand this diversity to really be able to forecast drug resistance potentially and patient outcome. 
So I'll just finish off the last two or three minutes of the talk by showing uh, uh, some evidence of recent data that's really surprising us and, and, and shining a bit of a light on some of this problem of heterogeneity. And dare I say it, um, uh, flip the coin to show some evidence of homogeneity in, in one isolated tumour that is that's surprising us that might shed some light on the differences between germline VHL syndrome patients with clear cell carcinoma in the kidney and sporadic clear cell carcinoma in the kidney that also shines a light on some interesting questions in evolutionary biology. So we started off on this experiment to ask a very simple question. If you have one patient with a germline um, mutation in VHL, who has multiple clear cell carcinomas of the kidney, how similar or how different are they, given that the patient is suffering from clear cell carcinoma of the kidney so that, that the microenvironment is the same, the, gen the genetic background that the tumor is growing in is essentially the same. So how similar are different tumors from the same kidney or between kidneys um, from a single patient? And these, these arguments go back 30 or 40 years in evolutionary biology to Stephen Jay Gould, who argued for the radical contingency of the human species. So he argued if you wind back the tape of life, the early days of the Burgess Shale, and let it play again from an identical starting point, the chances of us all ending up in this room as human beings with, with brains capable of understanding genetics, etc., and everything else, would be vanishingly small, and that there are many routes through, through evolution in general. But then... Conway Morris and others argue that actually there are many constraints to, tumor, to, to evolution that would actually mean that if you did the same experiment that Stephen Jay Gould argued, in fact, he would argue you get the converse, and it's quite likely that you might end up with the human species all over again. Now, of course, we can't address that within the context of cancer biology, but we can address some questions about evolution in general by looking at um, clear cell carcinomas that are growing within the same patient at the same time within the context of a patient with VHL syndrome. So this patient, um, who's from um, originally seen at Charing Cross and then um, by David Nicholl at the Marston, a 26-year-old male with a germline VHL mutation, who had a right radical nephrectomy, turned out to have two tumors, um, it, although they were one um, uh, consistent mass. By genetics, we could decipher these were two separate tumors. I'll show the data of that in a minute. And then about a year later, um, the patient had a left partial nephrectomy for a further two tumors on the left side. And the results are shown here. So here we've got um, the different, the, the four tumours shown along here, tumour one, two, three, and four. And where you see blue, that's a point mutation. Where you see grey, there's no mutation. And so the first thing you can see from here is that these tumours are relatively simple. And that's not because of tumour stage. So we've got mixed stage here. We've got two stage three tumours and two stage one tumours. And bear in mind, many of the clear cell sporadic tumours we were looking at were stage three. And yet we're seeing very limited evidence of diversity here and quite simple tumours in this young patient with only 13 or 14 mutations, about a tenth of the number that I showed you for patient one earlier. And here, none of these tumors are showing branched evolution. They're all showing linear evolution, as far as we can tell. The second hit here is 3P loss of heterozygosity. So every tumor, of course, has the same germline event, same VHL mutation. But the second hit here is occurring at three different sites in 3P, chromosome 3P. So this is chromosome three along here. And where I've got the red circles in these four different tumors, you can see the four different sites where the breakpoint's occurring, resulting in loss of the 3P chromosome, that is, loss of the other VHL allele. So we think the second hit is 3P loss of heterozygosity that's distinct in each one of these tumors. And then when we look at the drivers, what we see is that each tumor harbors a distinct subset of drivers. So right, the right kidney tumor 2 has an IDH2 mutation. The right kidney tumor 1 has an arid one a mutation. The left kidney has four different mutations that are distinct from tumor 4, although tumor 4 also has an mTOR mutation that is distinct but likely to be an activating event similar to the left kidney mTOR mutation, but which is distinct, showing convergence. So here I think we've got some evidence for contingency and convergence. Convergence in that you've see, you're seeing two distinct mTOR mutations in the same kidney, but also contingency in that, every, in that every tumor is different, despite the fact it starts off in, from the same germline mutation and the same microenvironment. So in other words, I think Gould and Conway Morris are both right in this context. So in the context of the mTOR mutation, what we see is that there are two different mTOR mutations occurring, threonine 1652 and leucine 2427, that are predicted both to be activating events. And when you look at, we, when we did phosphoproteomic studies with my colleague Fabrice Andre at Institute Gustave Roussy, 
what Fabrice managed to show is that this mTOR activating event is indeed likely to be an activating event in that we see hyperactivation of phospho-AKT, a target of mTOR, um, in the tumours on the right side, indicating that this mTOR, activate, in mTOR mutation that's distinct between tumours 3 and 4 has the same um, biological endpoints targeting the phospho-AKT 308 residue. And this, this leads me on to the last 30 seconds of the talk to say where we're heading next. So James Larkin, myself, uh, Tim O'Brien, and uh, David Nicol Lamarsden are setting up a longitudinal study in clear cell carcinoma of the kidney to address some fundamental principles of tumor evolution. We hope to ultimately be able to optimize some of the clinical trial aspects and identify the branch drivers on a patient-by-patient -patient basis, exploit some of the constraints to cancer evolution over the next 10 years, we hope, and begin to define some of the relationships between diversity, clinical stage, and cancer outcome. And in time, we hope to match into these longitudinal studies, autopsy programs, where we can begin to define the origins of the lethal subclone at multiple metastatic sites of disease, and identify some of the impacts of therapy on cancer evolution, as well as develop non-invasive techniques to monitor cancer evolution non-invasively through blood tests. So in summary, I think we need to address the two fundamental principles of Darwinian evolution. We need to identify the mechanisms driving branched evolution. We need to understand why some tumors are branched and some tumors aren't, why the, why the VHL syndrome tumors show linear evolution. We don't understand this. I think it's the patients are a lot younger. They're diagnosed earlier through screening programs, perhaps. And we need to improve our cancer selection pressures. We need to optimize drug development against VHL loss of function and resolve the subclonal dynamics, as well as understand the evolutionary pressures through these longitudinal studies. So thank you very much for listening. If there are any questions, I'll try to answer them. I should just thank, very quickly, the people who've made this work possible. Um, James, my colleague and friend in the Marsden, um, as well as the surgeons who've made this work um, possible, as well as my colleagues in Suku Safrusi and all the people in the lab, um, both here, both at CRUK and uh, University College London, who've helped with this work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Hello, uh, Charlie, thank you. That was a fantastic talk. Um, really enjoyed it. I've got two brief questions. The first is, on the mechanism of heterogeneity, why it's so, so very impressive, impressively sort of tree-like, um, the, the, the data that you, you told me about before in colorectal cancer, I think, with replication for abnormalities, yeah. is that relevant to renal cancer? That's the first question. Yeah. And the second question is, it, I'm not sure you modeling is the right term, but you, you're considering these subclones as independent of each other. Yeah. Do you have any data to say whether they interact, perhaps to compete for resources, mm -hmm. for example, so that targeting one clone may actually release a second clone? Yeah. Uh, two great questions, Tim. Um, answer your first question. We don't have an answer to either of the questions, but I'll speculate wildly, if you don't mind. Um, the, the first question... We, we strongly suspect that some of these early branch drivers are actually initiators of heterogeneity themselves. So we're spending a lot of time exploiting the function behind these inactivating events of these common drivers to see if they themselves can drive branch evolution. Um, the second question, um, is there clonal competition or clonal synergy? I think inevitably there must be. I mean, any population, there is synergy um, and antagonism. Um, and competitive release, I think, is something that we probably see quite frequently in clinical trials where we target a drug-sensitive subclone and the resistant one springs up to, to, to compete within the same environment. Um, so this is something we're, we're trying to model, but to model it, we need, we need better animal models, actually. So the, the sort of starting point for this is to develop um, an animal model of VHL, clear cell carcinoma of the kidney, number one, um, and then to try to model some of these branch driver events on top of that to try to initiate diversity within these tumor models to start to study those critical questions that have quite, I think, major implications, I suspect, for the way in which we think about targeted therapies, targeting drug-sensitive subclones to lead to the release of resistant ones that we can't do anything about. Yeah, thank you very much. I have a question concerning the source of your biopsies. We have learned uh, during the last years that, um, that uh, the source is of, of a liquid biopsy may be a lot better one to, it, to identify uh, driver mutations from passenger mutations. Do you think also too? 
as a, a liquid biopsy as a, as a source for, for, for mutation. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, uh, circulating free DNA and potentially CTC analysis is going to be a very good source to identify driver mutations. Whether it's the best, we don't know. And one of the purposes of TracerX is to address that question so we can compare the heterogeneity of a nephrectomy specimen with what we're seeing in CFDNA. Does it really adequately reflect the diverse landscape that we see in a primary, primary metastatic tumor? We, we, nobody's really done that experiment methodically enough to be able to come up with a, a solution. That ev the emerging evidence is that it is pretty good. How good, we don't know. Well, thank you. So 